Hello, everybody. Welcome to Fruitful Trees. And today I am in Jupiter, Florida. And you can see it's sunny out here where I am. But I'm going to a place that's not too sunny. It's very shady because there's a lot of things shading it. This is a local yard slash farm. And it's very cool. We're going to be taking a look at it today. But as you can see, uh, they keep it. Uh, they have a fence in front and they mow the lawn in front of the fence so it doesn't look too out of control. But when you go inside this place today, it's pretty amazing how they're showing how you could have a sustainable uh, food and eat most of the food you live on. And it's not only fruit trees. They have a lot of other different types of wild edible herbs and, and perennial greens and so on. Uh, a while ago, I was at a place in, uh, in the west coast of Florida called Eco. Uh, and this is like a mini Eco. It's amazing. And it's really wonderful here, everything they're doing. And we're going to meet Amanda today. And Amanda is uh, just so knowledgeable in this. And they've only been here three years. And this was just a, a garden when they came here. Not even a garden. It was just empty lawn with some, a few trees, some fruit trees. But they've really taken off and they've done a lot here. And uh, they're so given to the community. They do, they do tours here as well. Look, there's a little uh, borrow library here and they have bees here they have so much growing here so we're going to meet amanda and we're also going to talk to our husband about the different trees that they have here's a papaya tree and this is the entrance here we go and this is the name they're called the pike food forest and it's established in 2019. so let's meet amanda and then we're going to meet our husband and he's going to tell us about some of the fruit trees they have here and amanda's going to talk a lot about the uh, all the edible wild herbs and things they're doing with this so here we go hey everybody today we're at the pike food forest in jupiter florida established 2019 so about three years ago and here is the reason why we call it the pike forest amanda pike uh, so uh show us around your property here or at least tell us all about it so it's three years old right so it's three years old and we're leaving our natives as host plants for a variety of native insects that serve as soldier bugs so we don't use any pesticides, herbicides, or fertilizers. We just use natural methods. So our oak leaves, especially with the tannins, are a great fertilizer, um, suppressants, and uh, just help to keep the ecosystem in check. So we are preserving any seedlings that we find as they come up, and pines as well. And when you say you're leaving your natives, just for those of you that aren't clear on that, you see this big tree behind her. Uh, so on this property, when she moved here, there were a, a bunch of trees already here, some fruit trees established already, and some oak trees and pine trees. And she's leaving the oak trees and pine trees. She didn't take them out to add anything else. She's not taking anything else. She's leaving everything and adding to what's already here, correct? Right. So it's, it's hot in Florida, and a lot of plants struggle with the heat. So on your seed packets, you'll see full sun, but what they mean is full Seattle sun, full reach Rochester sun, but they do not mean full Florida sun unless you have an ongoing irrigation system. We have no irrigation. And if you look around, I mean, it's very lush and green. So in times of drought, it doesn't stop being lush and green. And that's really predominantly because we have leaf litter and mulch that prevents uh, evaporation. And so we do let uh, wild ground covers take hold. <clears throat> this is uh, Wedelia, and it is a pollinator plant. It is an invasive. However, it prevents the soil from eroding. It also prevents uh, evaporation of water, and it, it's fodder for our bees. We have 26 beehives. So pros and cons to each of the, the wild plants here. So we have some wild edibles like firebush, which is a nice native. Our hummingbirds love it. And in Mexico, they make a wine out of the berries. My chickens also love the berries. So here we just have a row of katuk. It's a type of wild spinach. It's very delicious. So I'm just doing a row of it. The berries are edible. The leaves are edible. Delicious. Yeah, we have some variegated varieties, which are a little bit more like kale in terms of their texture and their flavor. But then I have some non-variegated that are very tender, very sweet. So they, this is your front yard. You have all these where you're showing us and you have a row of katuk right there. Yeah, I have a row okay. of katuk. This is a row of turmeric. I'm doing a row of achira in between Biden and Zalba. So we do not weed. We do not pull up roots. And one of the reasons that we don't do that is we don't want to disturb the fungal layer in the soil. Um, we have a lot of fertility because of the fungus in the soil. And if we were repetitively pulling, we wouldn't have that. Also, Biden's alba is a wild edible. Uh, it's a medicinal. 
it's the third ranked pollinator source for bees in Florida. So it's a really important wild plant with a lot of uses, human and otherwise. Also, it re it's a bioremediator plant, so it removes toxins from the soil. So say we have roof runoff, we have an asphalt roof. So if we have toxins coming off the roof and I have a tuber, like turmeric or a chira growing, I absolutely want Biden's alba that I'm not gonna eat growing am among it to absorb any toxins that might be in the soil. So it's just a good check and place for any contaminants. Okay. So we have different pollinator plants and we're also planting native. So we were gifted this, uh, this oak tree and oaks are the original grain. So Native Americans used acorns as a huge corn essentially. So it's just a good plant to have on the property. Um, historically, if nothing else. Do you use it at all for food? Oh yes, yes. We, my, we, we enjoy using it as a seasonal novelty. So we make candies out of it. I'll make coffee out of it. It's just a fun seasonal novelty. But throughout history, it has kept populations alive. I mean, it produces hundreds of pounds of, of acorns with no irrigation or fertilizer. So it is like the original corn. So besides the oak trees that were already here, you actually edit an oak tree. Absolutely, yeah. Oh, wow. So they're, they're, they, they provide consistent dappled light. And dappled light for us is the ideal amount of sunlight. We're in South Florida. It is very hot. We get many hours of sunlight. Most plants, most greens, and we do mostly eat, I try to eat mostly greens. They only need four to six hours of sunlight. And so that includes dappled sunlight. So you don't get the leaf curl because you don't have nematodes. When you have direct sunlight, the soil gets baked and then it's more prone to pests like nematodes. With dappled light and constant leaf litter, the soil is so fertile that we don't have any pest issues. So this is a red maple that we put in. It does yield syrup. It's a baby right now. This is a mulberry. We're putting we mulberries got all over. We love mulberries. A mulberry here. So this is the mulberry, the, one, of, one of the mulberry trees here, right here they planted, okay. We're planting lots of mulberry. There is research that mulberry should be considered a staple crop because of the protein in the leaves. So I'm very interested in researching that more. Um, I'm wondering if it's certain varieties only or if it's all varieties. And if so, I'm ready to start doing like... So the leaves of at least some mulberry trees are edible or they're all edible? There's a that's what I need to research more. But I've read several citations that say mulberry should be considered a staple crop because it yields fruit and vegetable and the protein in the leaves is high enough to be considered a main course. I've heard many of the fruit trees, the leaves are edible, but a lot of people don't know that. I heard papaya leaves are edible. Papaya leaves are edible uh, cooked. So mulberry leaves would be edible cooked. So it just depends on the plant. Yeah, and in some trees, their fruit trees, their leaves are used as like a tea or like a bay leaf. So I've got June plum and other plants that you would just throw it into a pot in soup and it would just add that little bit of extra flavor. Sure. So coming off the house, most Florida houses are built up on a gradual slope and so it's effectively like a desert scape. So we are planting lemongrass, rosemary, pineapple, aloe, these types of things, goldenrod, which is a native tea, uh, a really historically important tea. And uh, we're letting our pollinator plants also fill in just for erosion control. And uh, yeah, it works. It's very now nice. You have two papaya trees here, no yeah. irrigation, and they're growing just fine, right? We have no, no irrigation. Um, we do divert some water off, but honestly, that was kind of a, a rookie mistake. I don't think it's necessary at all. And it probably, it's totally unnecessary. Now, do you hand water anything or you just let nature do what it does? No, we have the pool enclosure, which is a nursery. And so I water, I water the nursery every day, sometimes twice a day, but that's not an ecosystem. I put it out here. I usually plan to plant right before there's rain. So I'll be out here in the rain planting. Um, or we're supposed to get a category one storm this week. I'm going to be out here planting a lot right before the storm hits. So then the, all the plants get established and that's it. Before, you, before you're going to plant? Right before the storm hits or as the storm is hitting, I'll be out here planting. Now, why wouldn't you wait till the storm passes? 
because uh, I want the rain to push the roots down. Got you, got you, okay. So that, that'll make sure that the, the plant gets established immediately. But on a young plant, isn't there a chance of the plant blowing so it won't be established? I mean, it's going to be nestled. So the way that I'm planting is it's protected. It has windshield. And also the way that we're keeping our natives um, and we're intercrop, like we're creating guilds and interplanting, we've got a lot of, of windshield, especially for things that are very low to the ground. So uh, no, it, it'll be fine. And, and I plant 10 times what I need to eat. Right. So if we have some losses, it's not a big deal. So we consider the coming off the house to be a desert scape and then you can see the yard sort of ebbs and flows with its topography and so we're maximizing that. So when we first moved on the property, um, we came out with a can of spray paint and my husband was laughing because I'm out here in a raincoat, torrential rain, and I'm just spray painting around all the puddles. And so that way we're utilizing the natural topography um, to plant. So wherever there were puddles, we put a chira, sugar cane, mulberry, bananas, things like that. But papaya want, cannot handle wet feet. So that's why it being on a slope is exactly what it wants. Great, and for us, uh, everybody watching, this is about two acres uh, that where we're at here looking at today, two yep. acres. It's 2.6 acres and we have ag exemption for almost all of the acreage. So we're considered a farm just based on our plants, which I think is very progressive for the county because uh, this is not traditional ag, it's not traditional rows. So permaculture is a revival of what humans have done throughout history, um, but governments haven't taken a hold of Western governments. So the fact that they gave us ag exemption on our first application, we considered a huge success. Wow, that's great. Yeah. So this is Chaya, and uh, we I, I harvest a whole tree once a week. I just cut the tree right down, and it'll grow right back, no big deal, once it's established. Um, and then I'll just make, I make a spinach pie out of this. I, you have to cook the leaves. It's, a, it's called Mayan spinach tree. It does have cyanide in the leaves, but the toxin is released through gas through boiling. So you boil with the lid off for about 20 minutes. And it is delicious, high protein, high calcium and iron. So most women around my age, postpartum, start to become calcium deficient to the point where they're prone to osteoporosis. So most women in the United States are prone to osteoporosis. So a plant like this, I make a huge casserole dish and we just eat it every night, like with whatever else we're eating. Or sometimes I'll have it for breakfast. It's delicious. And so just- If you, if you have a recipe, I'll post it below the video for everyone could see that chaya recipe. Sure, the chaya recipe is you boil for 20 minutes. I take the leaves off. Then I just toss with capers and raisins, little, maybe a little olive oil, maybe not. Then I just stuff into a casserole dish. I chop it smaller and I put a little bit of phyllo dough on the top, bake for maybe 10 minutes. And that's after it's boiled. Okay, wow, that's amazing. And so once the tree's established like this, you cut it down at the bottom. All the way to the base. And then how long before it grows back again? It's, it starts to grow immediately back. And so it maybe takes about two months for it to reach the size again. Okay. So I every time I cut it back, I plant another one, but I was talking to my neighbor, he was like, you need 52 trees if you're going to have it once a week. And that's, it's yes and no, because it grows back so fast. But I'm putting them everywhere because I have friends asking me to gift them chaya pies. And now how, how easy is it to grow this? Because can you grow from a cutting? Absolutely. It's so easy to grow. Like I, you, I just go around my yard after I harvest. I'll just cut off arbitrarily. Like, oh, I'll take this cutting. I'll take that cutting. And I'll just stick them in the ground. Just four to four to six inches is kind of the sweet spot and you put 50% in the ground and that's it. Um, and probably if with no attention, I might have 40% take with no attention. Wow. And then I just take the rest and I'm building land mass on our wet side. So we can go to the wet side. Okay, what's this beautiful tree here? This is um, mimosa. This is, we're using it as a bee fodder. So you can see my bees are all over it. They just love it. And so um, we have 26 hives and they just, they go bananas over it. It's a nitrogen fixing plant. It grows very fast. So we constantly have to hack it back, like hack it. And it's, so it's gonna be very rich in nitrogen. So I can then feed my other plants constantly. So I'm putting this in all four quadrants, you know, north, south, east, and west throughout my yard so that I have a, a fodder for the bees, but also um, pro, like a prolific chop and drop and just an ornamental. It's very pretty. Wow, and I see some uh, hibis cranberry hibiscus right there. Yeah, we have cranberry hibiscus. Um, I like to use this seasonally. It has maple shaped leaves. So I like to press it into um, like yogurt, 
and then I'll freeze it um, and make kind of like a bark, break it, and you can just eat it like a holiday bark. Traditionally, people would, you know, use white chocolate or something, but we used yogurt. Very delicious. That's wonderful. Okay, you were going to show us your wetland area? Yeah, these, this is our wet area. So when you move into any property in Florida, the county has probably done a soil assessment. So you can call the county, ask them for a link to, your, to the, the soil testing site and then they have a, a diagram of your yard at, with what soil types you have on the property. So we have Floridana sand and Riviera sand. And you know, the Riviera sand does not drain as well. So this is a non-draining site. So we're creating drainage, but also we're just capturing as much water as possible. So um, we've got lots of bananas, malanga. I've got a tropical almond here. And I don't know why tropical almond is not a commercial a commercial crop so it's superior to our commercial almonds so a lot of people use almonds in a variety of dishes and however almonds are a very processed food they have to be there our commercial almonds have cyanide they have to process the cyanide out before it hits the store this almond does not have cyanide it grows like a weed this plant is two years old and it's already producing almonds for me it is enormous the leaves are antifungal, so as they drop, the biggest problem on a wet side of a property is fungus. And we have mangoes and other crops over here that would be very susceptible to fungus. So I love this tree. Um, and it prevents soil erosion. It's a wonderful, wonderful tree. Um, so it tastes just like almonds. You can do anything that, with almonds that you currently do with almonds with this almond commercial almonds that you find in the store, the oil goes very rancid. And so a lot of the food that you buy at the grocery store, by the time you get it, bring it home, decide to make it, it's already rancid. And that's true of almonds. So I put all my nuts in the freezer, as you should, so they don't go rancid. But this nut does not go rancid for many years. And so it, it you can see that in its behavior, the way that it's like traveling all over the world. It stays viable in its seed case in oceans and then will still be a viable seed to, to germinate. Um, the oil can be extracted and is a very pleasing oil, does not have high rancidity like our tropical, like our normal almond. And so considering have, it's tropical, it grows great here in South Florida. It grows like a weed here. I have wow. my friends who have established trees and, I'm, and I just ask them for seedlings and they have grows like a weed. And, and once the almond comes off, it's in a, it's just like a, in, in just a like you would find the almonds are like uh, the holiday time in the store. They're in a case and you yeah. got to take them out. Just crack them. And, yeah. but we have seen people crack them with a rock. So it's not, you know, they say, oh, it has a hard case. It's difficult. All nuts have a hard case. I mean, that's kind of the definition sure. of a nut. So. Sure. Um, and then you got some bananas. Are these just wild or do you got them particularly named bananas? So um, almost everything that we have on the property is on a shoestring budget. So we did not blow our bank to, to do any of this. This was a seedling from a friend. All the bananas came from friends. So, people, you know, bananas reproduce quickly. So people are looking to maintain their clump. And some people want highly manicured yards. They want a clump this big. And they'll, they'll, they'll pay you to come dig them out, you know? So we, we just traveled around and got people's bananas. And they're of all different varieties, which is healthier for our ecosystem. So throughout the world, the Chiquita brand is sort of predominant. That's what everybody sees in the grocery store. Well, unfortunately, that is getting hit by disease every single place it's grown. So because it's a monoculture, when you have one variety of a plant, then the diseases become specialized to that one variety of a plant. So the whole plantations are being wiped out. So we have like 50, 60 different varieties of bananas. They're delicious. We mostly eat them green. We boil them like potato, treat them like rice. Um, we use them as a wheat substitute. I use it as an oat substitute. So we use them all the time. And then when they're, um, when they're ripe, we use it as an oil substitute, an egg substitute, although we have plenty of eggs. So when you give them, uh, after bananas, uh, uh, have their bunch, they don't reproduce bananas always, maybe twice at most, but do you cut the stalk or do you just leave it growing? No, you'll see, we have, uh, we cut them down. So, um, we were, we're building land mass. So these are our swales. So in times of torrential rain, this is a river, it's like a creek, you know, the low lying areas. So our goal is to build this up to be five, six inches. So every time it 
it fruits, we hack it and just drop it in place. And let it stay right there. And it's okay. land mass. Um, and then we're actually just dragging over huge limbs from other trees and dropping them in place too. To and that's what's so important and amazing about this. So when you came here, this was just besides the few native trees, this was just all empty grass. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Most of the lawn, I mean, it was most of this yard was just sod. And in three years, you have a food forest here. Yep. Yep. Permaculture happens really fast if you let it, if you work with nature. I mean, the nature always wants to reforest. So we're creating a forest. Yeah, so we have delicious varieties. You know, all, all the name brand varieties we have, you know, we've got ice cream, be, be, uh, ice cream. we've got uh, praying hands, Nam Wa, we've got blue java, we have them all, but you know, we're not like name brand people, we're, we're trying to eat from the yard. So if it's edible, we'll take it. And that strategy works really well for us. And it just constantly is just a pleasant surprise as we can, we have these recipes and a menu that I have and we just supp okay, now we're going to use Nam Wa. Now we're going to use praying hands and to understand the difference and how the same recipe manifests using Nam Wa versus, you know, like blue Java or something is very interesting. Same thing with our mangoes. We use our mangoes green. We use as much as possible green because if you wait till it ripens, well, you've got a lot of a lot of fruit on your hands that has a very short, you know, shelf life. So I use uh, the green mango as um, like a Granny Smith apple substitute. So we'll make apple pie or coleslaw. It's delicious. It's so, so good. this is uh, did you? Get mangoes from friends as well and just plant the seeds or are these name varieties? So some of them are name varieties, but the previous owners, you know, we have some neighbors who say, oh, they probably just threw the seed. That's how we are. You know, I mean, Johnny Appleseed, the whole concept of Johnny Appleseed uh, was biodiversity. And so, yeah, name brand varieties are good for predictable flavor, but most of the varieties have such a, they're, they're, they're grafted for high sugar. And we're eating so much from the yard that after a while you're like, I'm good on sugar, you know, I really want some other things in my life. <laughs> so we have so many varieties. Each one is so different and it's not all high sugar content. How many varieties of mangoes do you have? Do you think? At least 25. 25. Do you know which one this is? Um, no, my husband can tell you. He's, he's the mango guy. Okay. He, we joke that he looks up and I look down. So. He's the one looking at the trees and pruning, and I'm the one like putting the seeds in. And so you do prune your trees? My husband does, yeah. He'll climb up there and just hack the top off. And Now with the mango trees or any other your fruit trees, do you do any grafting or you just let them grow the way they are? Um, so we, we have done some grafting. Um, we have a neighbor who's grafted. <laughs> Kenny has grafted like yes. a different variety on each limb on some of our trees over there. And so he's like, oh, it's a fruit salad, you know? It's awesome. So yeah, we work. We have a lot of community, a lot of just support, um, a lot of relationships that this is built. So if somebody wants to graph a variety in our tree, they're more than welcome. And they can come get that fruit. Do you spray any of your trees at all? No. Nope. Okay. I did have a tree that was sick with fungus, so I just planted a tropical almond right beside it, and now right. the tree is fine. <laughs> nice. So. so we're planting natives as well. So. You know, I've got swamp hibiscus back here. I've got Pachira glabra, which is like a chestnut. I'm putting, so there's an oak seedling, I'm leaving it. There's um, a coconut palm. So it's gonna take a good 20 years to get established. But this is a wax myrtle. It's a, it's a host plant. You can make cosmetics out of the wax. Uh, you can use the leaves as like a bay leaf. Um, it's a very interesting plant. It's a host plant for butterflies. These are all mushroom logs. So we, we had a mushroom party, had our friends over. It was kind of a guy thing. My husband offered, you know, like refreshments and the guys came out, drilled holes and the kids, the kids all took um, hammers and just beat in these inoculated plugs and everybody had a great time. So we're, like, we're probably gonna do that every year. So these are yellow oyster mushrooms. So oyster mushrooms are the easiest mushroom to start with, but also we picked a daffodil yellow variety so that it's unmistakable. Uh, we're not gonna confuse that. There are no daffodil yellow lookalikes that we're gonna accidentally <laughs> ingest. So yeah, this is a, so you can see we're building it up. I'm building it up with some extra chaya. The chaya will root. You can see it's 
some of its rooting here. I'm also using Kosova to build the gland up mass. I just leave it here, let it root, and then it will rot. So it'll rot, root, rot, root. And so just create loamy soil. So my, besides the mulch from your own yard, do you bring any mulch in from outside ever? Yes, but we're on a five-year plan, and by year five, we hope to be done with that. And I think that we're creating the density where we're on track. So we also plan to get to like 70%, you know, between 50 and 90% of our food by year five, and we're at year three and already there. So we average 70% of what we eat comes from the yard already. So, and after this Ian storm blew through, it was very clear that we had plenty to chop and drop. And that's a really good thing. Um, when we bring in the mulch from the tree trimmers, it's a huge help. They're going to drop later today, uh, but it is labor intensive and also it's very dusty. So there are some health concerns. We have to wear a mask. You know, we have to take care of our ears. Um, when you drop, drop in place, it's all nitrogen at first. It's not carbon. It hasn't been, it's not being consumed already by uh, fungus. So by, by year five, we should be done with that. We got Simpson Stopper, which is a is like a bay leaf substitute, very delicious. So this is our wet side, but it's also my favorite side because we've got so many bananas established that it's shady all year round at any time of day. So the kids, we host 4-H for ages five to eight twice a week. And they're out here just running and screaming. And I know that they can do no harm. You know, little boys and sticks, that's like their thing. So the little boys will be like whacking the banana trees with sticks and it makes no difference. The bananas will just come right back, it's no big deal. But we are planting some um, staple crops that are just being researched but aren't predominant. So this is Maya nut. I don't know anybody else growing Maya nut, but I'm giving it a go. And in three to five years, it should start, it should start producing. So I contacted the Maya Nut Institute to try to find recipes from them. And uh, I mean, it's a staple crop. It's a fruit and a nut. And the nut is a balanced carbohydrate protein. So it does need to be cooked though. I think is my favorite. This one doesn't have enough nitrogen, but I'll show you some that do. Um, but this one is one that we eat raw and it is ridiculously delicious. Have you had Ibica? I don't know, but I'll yeah. Ibica is my favorite. It's okay. delicious. How do you spell that? A-I-B-I-K-A. -I -I it has a mild mucilage, so it, it like coats the tongue, it's delicious. It's recommended by the World Health Organization as a first baby food because it's not a choking hazard because of the mucilage. High in folate, high in protein. And it's, high a, it's a tree, does it grow taller or is it a feet. bush? 10 feet. It gets 10 feet, but it's herbaceous. It's herbaceous. Very nice. Yeah, but I've got some ones that have more nitrogen. This one needs a little nitrogen, so I just need to do more chop and drop at the base to get bigger leaf mass. The leaf mass can get maybe like five, six times this if it has enough nitrogen. So I'll show you some that have good nitrogen. Another chaya, chaya grows everywhere. I've got elderberry, Kachira glabra, it's like a chestnut. The chuck I'm putting everywhere, I'm gonna make it kind of like a border for erosion control. So I'm gonna start to just do um, katuk, katuk all along the edges to prevent erosion. This is our a native swamp hibiscus, just a nice native pollinator plant, but any hibiscus is a edible. Ibica is a hibiscus. So we're, we does put it in... grow a plant, a flower, Ibica? Yes, yes, it does. very good. And the flowers are edible. Edible too. Uh, that raw? Nice, yes. Nice. Yes. So I, 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 most uh, hibiscus, you know, Kachuk is edible raw too. This is a cypress we're putting in, so we're, we're doing a lot of natives. We've got pond apple here, which is a native. This is a date palm. A date palm here in uh, the dates grow here too, the fruit. Yeah, I'm growing two different kinds of dates. This is a date palm. I also have a cliff date. Hopefully they'll take. But jujube is a Chinese date. And uh, we've got jujube, a mature tree, and then I have seedlings. I'm I'm really into jujube. Oh yes, I am too. Uh, so uh, how big is your, well, you'll show us the tree. Yes. It's one of my favorites. Yes, and there's a lot of um, legend around the jujube. You know, they say it was the original Garden of Eden tree of knowledge. And then in Chinese medicine, it's essential. So it's a really great plant. This is the jujube. Okay, how old did you put that tree in? Yeah, what was it here? here when we got here. 
We also have a rambutan that's on the property. Oh, that, wow. That was here when we got Does here. it fruit well? Well, it was dead because rambutan was uh, zone 11, but we put plants all around it to create like a blanket and windshield. Now it's thriving. Wow. And you've gotten fruit off of it. We haven't gotten fruit off the rambutan yet, but I think we will. So this is your jujube tree. Yeah. Yes. And, and then uh, I have a bunch of seedlings. So, so you planted seedlings on, wait, let me see here. What's, oh, so you planted seedlings on a jujube? Yes, you can plant seedlings. I have seedlings in the okay. full enclosure. So this one, uh, it gets good fruit? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. More bananas. Mango. Um, I'm planting a lot of jackfruit. So researchers say that jackfruit is the tree that's going to address increases in world hunger. So um, we're planting a lot of jackfruit and we use it mostly as a vegetable. So we use it mostly green. And I just cook the latex out and then I make um, chicken cacciatore with it. My, that's the most popular thing that we make. It's delicious. But the so there's seeds, another mango and uh, you don't know what variety? No, my husband would know. I, okay. These are my people in Seattle. We've got Hayden. Um, the, the reason jackfruit is considered a crop that will address increases in hunger, and this is a young one, but I'll show you a mature one is because the seeds are a wheat berry equivalent. So the seeds um, are like this big and they nutritionally are a carb protein balance. And so that's what people live off of, right? Like wheat berries. So around the world, most of the world survives on only three foods, rice, corn, and wheat. So the problem is all three of those are annuals that lead to environmental degradation. So if you can find replacements for those that are perennials, well then we've got a lot of environmental solutions. So jackfruit lives at least a hundred years and uh, it's a beautiful tree and highly prolific. It's one of the most enormous fruits. It can get up to a hundred pounds. So a fruit is a fruit, a vegetable, and a wheat replacement, so carb and protein. Now, like, besides boiling the seeds, is there any other way you found out you could prepare them? Yeah, I feed it to my sourdough starter to make bread. You can dice it up, like you can chop it up in a food processor as like for rice. Um, so we use all of our carb protein balances as substitutes. Cooked or raw, drop them. Uh, this process. one you could probably sprout. Yes. I mean, you can, sp like we sprout, I just sprouted a whole bunch of pigeon peas. Pigeon pea and jackfruit are the two crops that researchers are saying will address increases in hunger and seeds and nuts. As you know, you, I mean, seeds, you can sprout, sure. you know, so that they can be eaten raw. How many jackfruit trees do you have here we, so far? Um, we have probably 10 and okay. I'm going to plant a couple more One. because we eat them constantly. I mean, we'll go through a huge, we'll go through two huge fruits a week. I mean, they're oh, delicious. Wow. So because we're using them for so many different things. I love this, this plant back here. This is our, our, our oldest oak and it has a, um, Ficus aurelia, it has a stringless fig coming off of it. And I, I'm trying to decide whether or not I'm going to leave it because the strangler fig is a good habitat plant as well. But I'm, I may not, we'll see. But uh, it's a beautiful oak. This, uh, and it's helping to, you'll see that I don't have any winged beans growing anywhere else because of the, the way the sun is hitting my other trellises. But with this dappled light and the constant leaf litter, I've got so many winged beans coming off this trellis. And I just love winged beans. You can eat them raw, they're delicious. And then I've got all these butterfly peas as well that you can eat raw. Have you ever had butterfly peas? Uh, I think so, but I'll try it here. Oh, it's so see. sweet and delicious. It's considered an Ayurvedic brain tonic. And so we make, uh, we put them in our spring rolls, you know, our raw spring rolls. Delicious, um, delicious. Yeah, it's so good. We make tea out of it. And the tea in Thailand is a prop popular mood cocktail. So depending on your mood, you can add an acid or an alkaline solution. So an acid would be like lemon juice. An alkaline would be like some kind of milk, including nut milk. And so when you add an acid, it goes from blue to purple pink. When you add an alkaline, it goes from blue to like green. So it's really cool. The kids love it. We do a lot of pH lessons using pH sensitive plants. 
like butterfly pea, but also uh, we have a native beauty bush is also pH. Is that perennial, perennial all year? Yep, nitrogen fixer, good ground cover, erosion control, fodder. It's a really great plant. Now there's a fence here. Is this uh, where you edge your property or? You... Yes, this is owned by the diocese. And so the diocese has about uh, um, 40 acres. And so they just gave us an easement, which we appreciate because there, there were some invasives coming over and seeding, um, like Brazilian pepper, which is an allergen. Um, and you can have like lung damage if it's burned type of thing. So they were very responsible and we're thankful. So when you say the easement that's another family or something an easement just means they no i know the easement but you say who owns the property the diocese the it's the dio church oh it's a church okay the catholic church owns the catholic church owns a lot of property <laughs> okay and you how many millions is this and worth? you explain to them what you're doing here and you ask them to create an easement uh it wasn't just us yes we contacted them um we'd love to collaborate with them a lot of people wanted an easement for horses and other things okay but we um but it's, it's a great property, lots of wildlife. We get bobcats coming onto the property. We've got, you know, all kinds of wildlife, armadillas, other things coming onto the property from this wild acreage. And it's just so educational for the kids. Now, speaking of the wildlife, uh, you have a lot of edible plants. I yeah. know they don't mess around with the perennials as much as the fruit, but how do they mess with the fruit? They, uh, we share. So there's like a saying that you should grow at least three times what you need. One for yourself, one share for yourself, one share for your neighbors, and one share for the wildlife. And so that's definitely what we do, but we grow more like 10 times what we need. Okay. So we share with everybody who wants to. Um, but a funny thing happened at 4-H just last week. My son was climbing the ice cream bean tree right here to eat ice cream beans. And a raccoon didn't know that he was in the tree, and the raccoon climbed the tree to also eat ice cream beans. And the raccoon was like terrified once he saw my son and like leaped off. All the kids were uh, around the tree, so it was just so everybody loved it, you know. Everybody loved it. So, this is the ice cream bean here? The ice cream bean is over here. It's That's another mango. High. Are you allergic to bees? Uh, if I get stung, I don't know. Okay, so we won't go. <laughs> Super close to the okay. bees, but we'll walk here. The ice cream bean is here. Wow, that's a big tree. Yes. Yeah, lots of seasons when they need And I, I assume that was here when you got here, right? Yes, this one was here. Okay. This is one of my favorites. This gets lots of flowers that our, our bees and butterflies love. This is curry leaf. Have you had curry leaf? Uh, yeah, I smelled it. I don't know. I mean, I've eaten it in dishes. I love it. So this, this is curry leaf and... Um, it's not curry. So curry is a mixture of spices. Curry leaf has a barbecue umami, um, oh. yes, meaty, savory. And so we really don't eat much meat at all. Um, and uh, when I make chicken cacciatore, there's no chicken in it, it's jackfruit. And I saute a little bit of this. Oh, I mean, it's, and it just has all the depth of flavor. It's just so wonderful. It, it has that barbecue essence that um, really is gratifying. There's another mango tree. Yes, okay. we've got patchouli, rue. Um, this is purple collard. It lives up to um, up to 20 years. So it's a perennial kale, you know, brassica. Such a pretty plant with the purple and blue tones. Delicious. Um, so yeah, some people eat their brassicas raw. You can totally choose to do that. Um, we do blanch ours, but it's edible raw. It's delicious. So here are our bees. And we just love having them on the property. I mean, as we're doing our thing, planting or foraging and seeing the little bee butts <laughs> with their like half deep oh, wow. into a flower, yeah. it's just so wonderful. Wow, that's a bunch of beehives. Yeah, we probably, I mean, I would guess half million to a million bees on the property. Um, it's wonderful. Now, did you learn about that yourself when you got here? Or did you know how to do that before? Or do you no, bring someone in to do that? we lease our land to a beekeeper. We lease our land to a beekeeper in exchange for honey. So it's, it's, a, it's a lease agreement. So right. the beekeeper is breeding queens. And so we are interested in honey. <laughs> so. Got you. Great. Yeah. We've got guava. 
moringa. We just moringa. love moringa. Yes. Um, we've got soursop, Nepali. You know, we like to eat the pads, barbecued. Have you had any fruiting soursop yet? Yes. Yes, nice. delicious. Move on with two jackfruits on this side. We're doing pineapple rings around all of our around all of our pines. So it's like pine and pineapple are a marriage. Oh, do they really love each other? Oh, they love each other so much. And so we just because you know pines create these mounds, these natural little tiny islands, um, and the pineapples just love it. They love the pine needles that suppress other growth. And, they just do so well and it looks pretty together so we're happy so i'm going around all of my pines and just doing rings of pineapples and now how long before you plant the pineapple before it gets a pineapple how long? they say two years but we've gotten it much faster than that and then our oaks a nice relationship is uh the purple collards love my oaks so i can show you i have some that are multiple years old doing so well with no care under an oak so those that, that that's like a relationship, the brassica and the oaks, and then the pines and the pineapple are an easy relationship. And here's some of your uh, jackfruits. Yeah, this is our jackfruit. We picked it clean. There's no fruit on it because I'm like, oh, we need more, and it's starting to produce little babies again. Um, now tell us about this. Did you plant this here? This one was here. It was here. Yes. This and one you have here. no irrigation, and it still plants gets fruit. We have no irrigation, none. Yeah, this is avocado, but that, that's the whole thing with permaculture is that, I mean, humans did not have irrigation <laughs> for most of their existence. So it's just, if you, if you have to constantly invent to correct a problem you're creating, then you're creating a problem, right? Exactly. So, um, and that's kind of what's happening is that we're just creating one problem after another touting ourselves as super clever when if we just went back to basics it might be a little easier for everybody sure. and not that you should go back to basics for everything but some things you know do you know what kind of uh, avocado this is um it's a very fatty avocado um i i would have to look at the list of different varieties but it's it's not a florida avocado it's it's delicious fatty it looks like has might be if might be a hoss did you plant it so it was here? This was here. Okay. So when we were looking at properties, we knew we wanted to do a food forest. We had started creating a food forest in plantation. We lived in plantation on like a golf course, you know, the whole thing with the tidy yards. And uh, so we started doing it. And then we were looking at properties and wanting ones with mature trees. So they had kept their natives. They had added fruit trees. Perfect. The inside needed a lot of work, but the outside was perfect. We'll take it. So these are star apples. Oh wow, that's a big star apple tree. Yes, they're delicious. They're great, one of my oh, favorites. Oh gosh, these are delicious raw, so like this was, custard. They're so good. It's like better, it's like flan. Oh, it's so, so delicious. Is this a purple or a green one? Purple. Purple. And this was here when you got here? Yep, these two were here. Well, two, so you got two star yes, apples. I feel like I keep telling my neighbors, we need to meet the previous owners because they were awesome. Yeah, wow, and that's how big they grow there. And then there's this, this they star They grow from apple. cuttings and they grow from suckers. So I'll probably try to propagate this for friends. So those are just seeds coming up. I think these are root suckers. Oh, okay. Even better. Okay. And then uh, there's another star apple here. And this one's purple as well? Yes. So delicious. And that's interesting that there's four. Well, four I directions. Do think, I do think that a lot of our... Um, trees were grown from seed and people you know people poo poo that they're like oh grafted name brand but it's also like your shoes like I mean it's it's a preference um, and you know brand can indicate value it can indicate flavor but seed grown can also be incredibly delicious and some plants grow true to seed and some don't we have some mature coconut palms that were here. And I mean, coconut water. It's so funny because I'll have people, I don't know if you know this, but coconut's listed as, an, like, as a category, I think it's too invasive in Florida, like on the watch list, I think it's category two. I forget which category is the watch list versus the stop list, but coconut, the tree of life. I'll see people, 
espousing natives, like, oh, only plant natives, but they're drinking coconut water out of a plastic bottle. Yeah. And it's like, grow your own tree, man. It tastes so much better. It's better for the environment. And it's such a functional tree. I make milk out of it. I make cookies out of the out of the flesh. Um, the water is outstanding, especially when we're working out here. When it's when you have the good sweet water, the gelatinous jelly you just pureed into a pudding. I mean, it's so good. Oh, and the apples when they sprout. Have you had a sprouted coconut apple? Uh, the sprouted coconut. Yes, yes. I mean, we yeah. love that. We yeah. crack it open, and that's like angel cake. Yes. So we'll just layer that with some fresh fruit. It's an angel cake. It's so good. What tree is this? This one we're not. Did I label this one? I don't think we know what this one is. There are a couple of trees that are still mysteries to us and that we'll give tours and we're like, do you know what this is? Um, and all of our apps and all of our like plant guides haven't told us. And these, the people who were previous owners seemed really cool. So we imagine it's a cool tree. Yes. Um, so this one, I don't have a label on and I don't, we haven't gotten any fruit out of it yet. So there are a couple okay. like that. We've got maybe five trees that no, none of our apps will tell us what it is. and. Oh, yeah, so this is getting towards another desert scape in the front that we're using for agave. Is this another jackfruit? Yes. And, uh, oh, this, one, this tree I love. This is golden apple, also called cog plum. Oh, I love this. Yes, So that's you, a big one. Do you know this one? Yes. Oh, this one's delicious. I like to just juice it and keep, like, gallons of it in the fridge as, like, a lemonade substitute. So good. Um, Oh, it's so delicious. Love do you juice the seed too or no? I, I mean, I do. I haven't read any adverse effects. And when I'm cutting it, you know, the seed is spiny. So it's safer to just juice it. I do wait for this one to get ripe because uh, it's easier to cut through the flash. Is this just, yellow or red? It's yellow. Okay. So I just squish all the pulp off of it. And if I can easily squish the seed out, I will. And then it just goes right into the juicer. Very... Um, very pulpy, very picked and heavy. So it would make an easy raw like jam, just like pureeing it and letting the fiber swell. So good. Yeah, so we've got some agave, Nicali's up here. I, I have an edible bamboo. You would have to cook it, but I got an edible bamboo that was supposedly edible raw, um, Elatus. But uh, you know, it's a risk. But this is this is a. Um, a Thai version that you do have to cook, but it should get huge and provide us with nice ambient sound. So we're trying to garden for smell, uh, visual, taste, obviously, uh, but also sound. So um, it's a bamboo with the creaking and the knocking. Ah, oh, so wonderful. So here we are at the front of the property. We've got true, um, true coffee here. You can see another gill. Coffee. <laughs> Some more pineapple here. This is the front row in the front. So, so we okay. mow against our fence rather than using our fence <clears throat> as a trellis to send a clear message <laughs> to the neighbors. This is not an abandoned lot. Uh, this is a managed garden. This is a managed farm. So by keeping this three foot <clears throat> mow path and, and just weed whacking our fence, it's obvious that it's maintained. Yeah, it's a maintained property. And then we do that as a respect on all four sides, even though our neighbors are awesome and very supportive and in, involved in, in multiple ways. Um, we give them a three foot from the fence. Just, just for that respect. Okay. Squirrels like the fence. <laughs> oh yeah. This is red mumbin. This one's very. Well, this is a great tree. And uh, I've got some lufa growing on the trellis here. Some what? Lufa. Lufa. Okay. And you can eat it when it's green, about oh, three wow. inches, as a cucumber substitute. So European cucumbers are disease prone, very difficult to grow without fertilizers and irrigation, but lufa grows like a weed and uh, you can, they're a cucumber substitute. So when they're under three inches, they're very tender. 
this is lipstick. Lipstick tree. Lipstick brush you got. Yeah. So, and most things people eat commercially have this in it without them knowing it. It's a natto. It's a food coloring, but it's also um, has anti-parasitic properties. So people use it as rubs on a variety of dishes for flavor, for color, but it has a functional purpose as well. And so we, we are trying to think of our wildlife as we eat these raw greens and things. We always wash anything we're eating green in a, in a wash. We do a one-to-one -one solution water to vinegar to make sure that we kill any parasites. Because this is in an ecosystem comparison like Asia. So we have to be careful with that. And so plants like this, with the birds eating the seeds and they themselves being cleaned of any parasites. It just helps to keep everything and everyone on the property healthy. So with our birds maybe releasing some of their fertilizer, we wanna make sure that that's a clean fertilizer. So do, speaking of fertilizer, do you use any fertilizer? We don't use any, any chemical fertilizer, but we've got chickens pooping, raccoons pooping, bobcats <laughs> pooping. We've got poop on the property, uh, birds, you know, so we're only those kind of fertilizers. And then the mulch itself is a fertilizer. Anytime we do chop and drop, it's a fertilizer, it's green manure. And then this, I'm, I'm playing around with some plants that are being researched, but aren't commercially grown. This is a tropical walnut. This is only a year and a half years old. Wow. Supposedly it grows slowly. So the seeds are very expensive though. I can't find any local source and the UK shipping rates have gone up like double, triple. So anyways, I wanted to get more of those, but I'm going to just wait it out. So that's our property in a nutshell. That in a nutshell. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Well, thank you so much. And uh, so do, do you give local tours here? Yep. Every Sunday at five, we give free tours. And then often we gift seedlings and cuttings and it's just a way for us to get to know the community and that's really the adventure we're on. So although for ag exemption, we did show we could make a profit and we do some things that are profit related. Most of what we do is a nonprofit model with the 4-H and a lot of gifting um, and the educational tours. Uh, so that's what feels best for us. Sure. Right and uh so if people can contact you i'll put the contact information below the video is that good for them to contact you yeah and then i have a book coming out uh it just basically itemizes each plant in a one page cheat sheet so we have more than 200 edibles so it's 200 cheat sheets one page how to grow it where to grow it how to eat it what part is edible and a recipe any health factors do you need to cook it can it be raw um and cultural information is it historically significant was it a staple crop was it buried with their dead because it was such a sacred plant? Things that you might, it might help you value a novelty. Sure. And when's that book coming out? Um, so it's listed on Amazon as being released on in February. So I sent it to the publisher. It's out of my hands. All right. I'll put the link below the video to that oh, as yeah. well. Yeah. Okay. So we use this as a, as a nursery and a gathering space for 4-H and other events that we host. So this is our hydroponic. I just reset it. The kids help me clean it out. They love it. They just like take it apart and throw it around, <laughs> shoot water through it, spray each other through the tubes. But yeah, I put my cuttings in here and they root within a couple of days. So this is the most efficient way that I've found to root cuttings. And it's just water. I don't put any nutrients in it. How's the water getting into this? Um, so I just, I have a bucket. So you can make, um, you can make a hydroponic with like 20 bucks, you know, you can just take a Tupperware container and then you just put a hole and then you get a $20 fish bubbler and that's it. And, and the you bubbler, can, you turn that on and it sucks the water up to that? Yes. So, but you don't need the hose. You could just make a hydroponic with a Tupperware container, putting holes in it and then just stick the plants directly in the Tupperware container. Oh, that's great idea also. Yeah. For like under 20 bucks. So we have that the kids work on. And then um, you know, with flower pot garden with different herbs, strawberries, some annuals. We try not to grow annuals, but the kids like the instant gratification. So we're gonna start cooking. I got an induction stove top here. Um, so the kids can start to cook the foods or prepare the foods if it's raw. So we make a lot of salads together. You saw my son brought you all those Turks caps. Yeah. <laughs> they love those. 
Um, the kids are always eating bananas, you know. We open coconuts together. I have this coconut opener that the kids really love. <clears throat> and it's safe enough where kids of all ages can do it, so they just put the coconut on it, and then it dehusks it, and then they use a hammer to open the actual nut wow. once they dehusk it. So they do that all the time. They love the coconut apples, the sprouted coconuts. That's their favorite. This is a bay laurel that we're propagating. These are <clears throat> Brazilian cherries that somebody brought us. The community is very supportive. Galangal I'm sprouting. Uh, this is a wani, wani llama. It's a medicinal herb that's so wonderful. As like a raw tea. You can smell it. It has a beautiful aroma. Oh, wow. Very uh, gently sedative. So it's a good sleep aid with no adverse health effects. And it's a digestive aid. So sometimes sleep disruption and digestive ailments go hand in hand. Absolutely. So this is a digestive aid, very popular in Costa Rica. What's it called? Wani Lama, also called Oaxaca Mint. So this I'm gifting to a friend who does some retreats. She's having some health problems. And it just has the, the butterfly pea, so she's going to start to have butterfly pea daily. And uh, yeah, this is our nursery. The kids did most of this. Um, we just lay out the tarp, and the kids, I mean, making cuttings, putting seeds in pots, all that is extremely kid friendly. So they're they're just getting all these cuttings to take. They just did the fig, and the figs are all taking the wow. patchouli, the vanilla. They did all that. They're going to be potting up the Nepali cactus. And so it's really great. The kids are figuring it out. And then once a quarter, we have a plant sale. And um, we just drag everything to the front and put up a tent. And that's it. And then the community comes. And all of the money that we make from the plant sale, we use to pay for teachers. So right now, we have a Tai Chi teacher. We're finishing up. Then we're doing a singing teacher. So we're going to take diff different songs and rewrite the lyrics to be food forest related. You know, so that'll be fun for the kids. Tamarind, and this is Inca peanut, echinacea. This is Jobs Tears. Um, yeah, so just. I didn't see any perennial peanut. Do you have that out there? Perennial peanut, um, the bunnies, it is out there. The bunnies love it. So <laughs> I haven't made carpets of it. I just put it here and there, and they find it, and it's for them. Um, this is bitter melon, which in Okinawa, we're really into the blue zones, so where people live to over 100 disease free. So we're studying what plants they grow, what recipes they use, and then just doing those. So Okinawa, Japan, Nicoya, Costa Rica, Ikaria, Greece, Sardinia, Italy, and Loma Lima, California. So this is an Okinawa, Japan plant. And uh, we've got licorice, pomegranate. Rose geranium is such a beautiful plant for, you know, raw teas. Oh, it's, oh, it's wonderful. Wow. Um, really wow. strong, beautiful smell. I like to just put it into water and put the whole thing in the fridge overnight. So that's a very gentle infusion. Such a wonderful astringent in the morning. So I'm growing all this mimosa, so it'll be a lawn replacement. So... And my, in my, from my perspective, if it flowers, it can stay weed or not. If it doesn't flower, it has to go. So got you. Yeah. We got pineapples there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're constantly rooting the pineapples. So do you root the pineapples before putting them in the ground? I, I do root them in the pot. Um, I root a lot of my cuttings before I put them out there, but some cuttings are a sure bet, so sure. I don't. The pineapples would probably be a sure bet, but um, this is the way we're doing it right now. Sure. Well, that's great. Thank you so much for oh, showing. Oh, you're so welcome. Okay, everybody. This is James Pike, uh, Amanda's husband. And as Amanda was telling you, she looks down, he looks up, and he's the one that uh, it, it knows more about the fruit trees. Uh, so I see, like, there's a tree right here, for example, a mango tree. So tell us, when you moved here, there were some existing fruit trees already? Yeah, we had um, already a lot of planted uh, fruit trees, tropical-style fruit trees. Our previous owners were from French Guyana. So a lot of interesting types, um, just to name a few. We had over 20 mango trees, and that was really exciting to me. It's one of my favorite fruits in the world. Um, we also had avocado trees, um, lychee, long-an, um, uh, carambola, star fruit, 
um, all different types. And then, of course, some really interesting ones like a curry tree, um, some banana trees. Um, and then since then, so those are the mature trees that you see on our property. Uh, right. This one here. Now, the, the tricky part is because they planted them, we have no idea what the variety is. Uh, we just get to find out when they fruit every year. So I'm learning how to, you know, I, I was an office geek when we moved here. And slowly I'm learning to become a yard guy and a tree guy and learn about the maintenance and the pruning of the trees. Uh, the mangoes are most important to me, of course, because I love them so much. So I've learned how to really try to prune them so that they'll fruit better and they'll stay under control. A lot of them were very much overgrown. So watching a lot of YouTube, talking to a lot of local experts to try and keep them up to speed. And it turns out a lot of those pruning techniques apply to a lot of the other fruit trees that are on the property. Now, did you know if they were, the trees were grafted or it's some seeds or you're not sure? No idea. No idea. According to my good friend, who I think you're going to go visit later today, uh, Kenny down the street, he uh, he's much more of a mango expert, but uh, he believes they were planted from seed and they kind of were just going with whatever comes up, right? So when they're not grafted, you're not really sure what kind of variety you'll get. We have a number of different sizes. This guy is the closest, I think, to what might be a Valencia pride, which sure. is kind of a kidney shaped, super delicious. We have one in the back that is gigantic, the size of your head. And really, I'd say the rest of them around the property are small in size, pretty fibrous, but really delicious. So we're excited with that. Sure. And uh, so as you're uh, tr checking these out, did you plant a lot of new trees since you've been here? We did. So in addition to the more mature fruit trees, um, I'll tell the story of when we got here in between the fruit trees. And if you look at our street view, it's a really fun uh, perspective. Maybe you can show a screenshot of that. But um, this was all lawn in between the larger trees. And so I got a really nice lawn mower and uh, started getting ready to mow my lawn. And Amanda was started to uh, spray paint her lines, make her boundaries, find her wet areas, her dry areas. And I was like, what are you doing? She's like, when I'm done, you're going to mow trails. And I'm, I, I didn't believe her. I didn't know what she was talking about. And sure enough, you can see our trails now. Um, but yeah, inside the trails, in addition to the bigger fruit trees, we said, okay, well, you know what? There's not a lot of shade. It kind of sounds crazy looking at our property right now to say there wasn't a lot of shade. But um, really, this whole area was not only uh, fully grass, but it was always wet. Whenever we had rain, it was just full of water. Like, I'm talking like uh, ankle deep. You know, we bought, the first thing we did when we came here was bought knee-high boots because, like, we couldn't believe it was just always wet. So we went around and we said, you know what, what do we eat? Uh, okay, bananas. We buy eight bananas every week from the grocery store. How can we get so we never have to buy bananas from the grocery store? Again, a feat that I thought was unaccomplishable. Uh, yet, here we are, that we talked to friends who would be willing to give us pups. I think we may have bought a couple, but the majority on this property, we now have hundreds of banana trees of all different varieties. The great part about bananas is when they sprout the pups, you can share. So we found we've, with Aman the community Amanda's help building, we've been able to share lots of different types of varieties of bananas, praying hands, Cavendish, um, apple bananas, I believe. Um, there's just so many different types. Again, we don't know really necessarily what the varieties are yet. When they come out, you can kind of tell depending on the length of them, the color. And we are super happy because we officially replaced, we've actually found out how many is our limit of how many we can eat every week. Huh. Uh, but we figured out Amanda has been able to take the banana trees and create all different types of bushes, all different types of dishes with cooking from green all the way to brown, like so many different ways to use the bananas in addition to sharing them with neighbors. And, and now friends. Amanda gave us so much information about all of the uh, herbs and all of the perennial plants. Uh, from a fruit tree standpoint, yes. somebody who came here three years ago and knew very little about fruit trees, especially established trees already, yeah. what has been like maybe your three top greatest tips you've learned through this trial and error? I would say, um, number one, just, just taking care of the mango trees. Um, there's a really great YouTube online about some guys in Africa that manage an orchard, and they take you through correction of pruning all the way down to pruning little small new growth. And I've learned a lot from that one and watched it over and over. But really what it comes down to is a lot of times with, with the mangoes, pruning the middle, the vertical shoots, so that you kind of have a donut effect around the edges and keeping the vertical shoots at bay, keeping the, the height low and the bush really kind of tight to the tree compared to some of the gigantic monsters we used to have on the property and you'll see around uh, Florida. That's been really helpful. That really helped our mangoes really produce and also allowed us to harvest them well. Besides that, 
It's been um, each one learning when to prune them, when to harvest them, and then of course how to use them to cook. That's been the most fun for us, you know, for as a family, because even my son gets in on the action, everything from as simple as smoothies. He'll make his own smoothies now and he'll put mangoes and bananas and um, sapodilla and guanabana and all these interesting fruits that we have on our property, you know, and, and try out different tastes. So uh, yeah. yeah. These, and then I think in addition to that, learning what is native and what will grow rather than annually grow with minimal maintenance. Uh, we have like a Jamaican cherry tree here. This guy, we just planted this one. This is a new one. And this has become one of my favorites as well. Uh, it's probably missing the red fruit from the bottom of it because the children during our 4-H uh -huh. lessons come and grab these. But they are just such a unique, fun flavor. And this, yep. again, this was this was planted very small. And here it is. I actually had to top it. Remember the idea of vertical shoots of fruit trees? I actually had to top it to keep it going sideways so that it wouldn't grow too big because it was getting huge. But these things are just so delicious. Little Jamaican cherry. They call it yeah. also a strawberry tree. It tastes like Captain Crunch. <laughs> yeah, so, so yummy. So yummy. Yeah. So um you know just wonderful kind of surprises of the fruit that of the new stuff that we planted has been fun as well. now is there any fruit tree you uh, that you don't have that you want to have that you definitely uh waiting mm. you got a spot pick that you're like i gotta get that tree we got a um black sapote the chocolate pudding fruit tree um actually this might be a good opportunity to mention how we do that um every christmas instead of buying a christmas tree that you end up throwing away we get a new fruit tree and we'll keep it in the house as long as it will take it. We'll hang our ornaments and lights on it as just kind of a celebration of the season and everything. And then we will take that as soon as it's ready, maybe after a week, maybe it could be a couple of days, we don't want to hurt the tree, and put it out in the property. And, and one year we got, last year was a cinnamon tree. Really excited about that, love cinnamon. And then before that was the black sapote. That one hasn't fruited yet, but I'm really excited about that one coming. And how big is the tree that you're getting? Uh, enough to fit in our living room. <laughs> so big enough to, Small enough to fit in the living room, but big enough to hang stuff on and just kind of have a festive. And you're getting these trees from local nurseries or are you just getting them from friends? Yeah, or? yeah, uh, mostly local nurseries. You know, we've kind of built a community and we try to look for nurseries that have reasonable prices, but also have an eye on, you know, the native stuff, the stuff that will grow locally um, very easily, even if it's not native. And of course, add the variety to our diet and our, our, our food forestry. Sure. And do you spray any of your trees at all? We do not. No pesticides. Um, the closest we we have a guy that will drop us off some manure when it's in excess. And uh, we like to put that at the base. Um, and of course, lots of mulch. Talking to lots of tree trimmers. They have to pay to dump their mulch. So we give them a call and say, anytime our gate is open, you may actually have to see a truck come in this morning. We're expecting a load. And they'll, we just, they just dump it on our driveway and mulch, mulch, mulch um, and, and manure. But that's it. No, no irrigation either. So we try, kind of rely on the different levels of the property to plant the right stuff, the wet areas versus the dry. No irrigation at all. Do you have a well at the property or no? Yes, there's a well in the back of the property, uh, but we use it for drinking water in the pool. <laughs> okay, and very well here. That's amazing. No irrigation and everything's green. Do you ever see anything in the summertime in the heat like that, that it looks like it could use water? But Absolutely. Or... So like this last summer, actually, we had a month, I think it, it, it uh, it was like the third most days in a while for above 90 degrees. I think it was August, I forget which one it was, but it was super dry month. And um, you can see some of the smaller stuff start to die back. Some of the, um, you know, just some of the ground cover start to ease back. Uh, the ones that struggled the most were actually the banana trees. And because they're mostly water, you some of those started to kind of droop and especially the ones with the racks on it. At any given time, we have banana tree, more than 10 racks on banana trees around the property. And they, those started to droop a little and some of them even fell because of the dryness. So we had to harvest the racks and be extra generous that month with our bananas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So do you ever take some hand water out and do you think you might? The only time I'll do hand water is, well, when Amanda, so uh, I don't know if she showed you yet, we have, we've turned our pool into a little bit of a greenhouse. And so that's where she kind of plants seeds and, and plants cuttings. She'll water those daily with a hose. Um, other than that, and maybe like if she really cares about a plant, she'll put it out in the yard and she'll give it some watering just to keep it going the first few days. But other than that, um, you know, it really is the two of us and we want to go with 
If it lives, great. If it dies, it wasn't meant to grow there. <laughs> now, when you get eat a fruit and you have the seeds, do you just throw them all in one different area or just anywhere around the yard? Or how do you do with that? Oh, no. So that, that was part, that's part of the experimentation of all of this. You know, Amanda has written her book kind of documenting all of her experimentation. But what it comes down to is trying a little bit in every place to see what works. And, oh, this grows here. Let's put more of that there <laughs> and seeing how that works. You know, um, she's taken the time now over over the last couple of years to actually document what actually works. She's really good about that, the attention to detail there. Um, but, yeah, no, it, it was a big experiment. Like, you'll notice these cranberry hibiscus are all over the property. We have these fire bush that are edible as well. They have little fruits on them um, with, that, are, that are edible. And you'll see them all over because they were experimented and some of them did really well all over, some of them maybe not so much. Uh, you know, it's the fire bush and that area was getting a little too much shade, so it wasn't growing so great. So what do you do with the seeds, like your mango seeds, for example? Mango seeds right now, um, really what we do right now is we compost them. So we take all of our food scraps, we're eating them. <laughs> and eating them and freezing them, because I like to enjoy uh, mango smoothies year round, but the seeds, we'll put them into our foods, our, put them in, into our um, compost bin. We have a nice five gallon bucket in the kitchen Put it all in there and that will become food for the rest of the food forest. So I don't know if Amanda told you about our lasagna method where she'll put the food scraps down, put cardboard on top of it, then mulch on top of that, put it around in the bananas, any of the fruit trees, anything that we want to grow really well. And that's kind of our recycling. And what ends up happening is we get some sprouts. We could get some mango sprouts and uh, we have neighbors and friends, uh, Kenny down the street, our, our, our local mango guy, he will take them and graft onto them. Um, because they end up being really hardy. They grew on their own from the foods grass. Yes. They're, they're great, strong trees to grow, to grow from. Yes, we're going to go see Ken. And uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for this. And I'm going to put their contact information below. You can come check out their tours. And I'll put the link to Amanda's book below as well. Awesome. Thank you very much. Anything else you want to add? No, thank you very much. Thanks right. for coming. Thank All right, you. everybody. Here is uh, the background here as I'm getting ready to leave this amazing place. We're going to go see the the fruit tree guy ken on the block but this place is really wonderful if you get an opportunity to come on out here the link is below if you want to learn about living sustainably and eating some good food right out of your garden not only fruit but all perennials and the greens check out amanda's book i'll put the link below to that and it was just a pleasure to be here i got a few ideas and i've tasted some things i haven't tasted before uh really nice people great place uh very excited to see how this turns out however we all have to do what works best for our environment and what our goal is. What they're doing here reminds me to, of a place that I was at in uh, Fort Pierce a while ago, uh, Natural Florida Living, where they just kind of the same philosophy. They let things grow and, and go the way it is. For me, this wouldn't work. Uh, on a small property, seedlings are not going to do it. I don't want to wait five years to find that I used that space for something that wasn't good. So you have two and a half acres. You can get away with doing this. I don't recommend doing this for a small property if you want to get uh, and know what you're getting when it comes to the seedlings and the fruit trees. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, but then if your goal is to just have mostly perennials and one or two fruit trees, or if fruit trees are already there, you can graft onto, you can make it work for you. But you got to look at where you are. And also in my area, I have to look at the front and the foot traffic. They don't seem to have that here. Uh, and so it's completely different environment and type of yard that I'm in and that I go to. It's not a nursery or a farm, a commercial fruit farm. So they're not, you know, with two and a half acres, if they desire to, and I love what they're doing here. I, I love this and I love the self-sustainability of it and, and eating for your food. That's why I do what I do. Absolutely love this. However, if they, with two, with two and a half acres, if you wanted to have a commercial fruit growing farm, you wouldn't do it this way. You have clean land and rows of trees. That's it. And you could have a, a very successful business and a lot of different types of fruit trees on two and a half acres, on even a half an acre or one acre. Uh, but that's not their goal here. Their goal here is being accomplished in what they're doing. And like she said, within five years, she wanted to be 100% self-sustainable. She's like 70, 75% now. They are definitely on their way. Knowledge is power and knowledge is a key. And they're learning through their trial and errors and they're doing it they're making it work so i'm really excited about this place you know it's a it's an education center they have here i would say more than a farm it's that she's teaching people and and people are going to learn by her tours and i love the fact that she gives the tours and the kids are learning while they're here as well 
So great job uh, to Pike Farm uh, here, Educational Center. Uh, so get on out here, the link's below. Everybody, thanks for watching. If you like videos like this and you want more, just let me know and uh, give a like if you liked it. And remember to subscribe to the channel and let other people know uh, what I'm doing is just getting out there and letting other people know about people like this. So uh, thank you for helping spread the word about fruitful trees. Until then, everybody have a great day and keep growing.